Uh, let's uh, first uh, quickly uh, review the syllabus. Uh, this uh, is uh, ECE 5675, uh, census and uh, sensor instrumentation. Uh, the prerequisites of this course include uh, ECE uh, 3570 uh, electronics, ECE 4330 uh, linear systems and uh, signals, and the uh, ECE uh, 4570 uh, microelectronic devices or semiconductor physics. Uh, in this course, we are going to study uh, sensors, sensing mechanisms uh, such as uh, piezo resistive, uh, piezo electric, uh, capacitive, and other sensing mechanisms. Sensor instrumentation amplifies noise and the frequency response. Right, those are other subjects we are going to cover in this course. Uh, I'm the instructor. I, I, uh, I believe uh, many of you have uh, already know me very well. Uh, the office hours is a, a Tuesday, 4 p.m. to 5 p.m., namely right after the class, all by appointment. If uh, you cannot make it, uh, send me email, make appointment. Uh, the office hour will be online. Uh, the course meeting time, right? Tuesday, Thursday, 2.30 to 4.10. As I mentioned, uh, attendance is uh, optional, but you can view the recorded uh, lecture later. I will, I will not uh, detect any point if you cannot attend the lecture, uh, but I you know, encourage you to attend the, the lecture. And it's so also important to know that uh, quizzes will be held during this time. So if you cannot, or if you have any uh, scheduled conflict, right, please uh, let me know right now. Uh, the goals of this course are to provide you with uh, both theoretical background and the hands-on skills of sensors and the sensor instrumentation, and to prepare you for research and the careers involving sensors and uh, instrumentation. No textbook is required. Uh, instead, class notes and the uh, selected literatures will be distributed in class. Uh, learning objectives. At the end of the course, uh, you will be able to uh, first explain the operating principles of a number of important sensing mechanisms Second, perform noise analysis of sensors and radar circuits. Third, analyze, design, optimize, construct, and uh, characterize fundamental radar circuits of sensors. And finally, write technical report effectively. Uh, prerequisites, right? uh, you are expected to have basic knowledge of circuits and uh, electronics, and also actually some uh, semiconductor fix. Computer resources. Uh, Multi-sync multi will be used for lab projects. Grading, homework will account for 20%, quiz, 50%, uh, projects, 30%. Uh, no, please know that you know, we used to have a lab project for this course, right? but this year due to the you know, pandemic, we can only do virtual labs, right? namely uh, lab projects based on 
uh, multi -sim simulation. Uh, this is the grading scale. Uh, a is uh, uh, 90 above, A minus 86 to 89. Uh, A is 90 to 79. Uh, that, right? B minus is 70 to 75. Uh, I know many of you are master students. So for master student, the, uh, the minimum score is uh, actually 70. Right? B minus is 70. Attendance, uh, as I mentioned, uh, it is optional to attend the lecture. Uh, topics and the uh, tentative course schedule. Uh, chapter one, introduction. We are going to uh, now review some basic concepts of sensors. Chapter two, operational amplifiers. Uh, we are going to uh, review what we have learned in the previous circuit and the electronic class, and also learn some advanced topics of OPEC. And chapter three, fundamental concepts of noise, like Johnson noise, thermal mechanical noise, one over F noise, and uh, OPEC noise. And then chapter four, readout circuits of photodiodes. Uh, chapter five, mechanics of things and the diaphragm, including uh, basic dynamics. Uh, yeah, if time allows, we will also learn uh, some basic console uh, simulation. Uh, chapter six, capacitive sensors and uh, instrumentation. Uh, chapter seven, a piezoelectric sensor design, instrumentation, and uh, optimization. And uh, chapter eight, piezo-resistive sensor design and uh, optimization, right, if time allows. Cost jobs and uh, withdrawals. In the first two weeks, you can drop this class and receive 100% tuition and the cost fee cancellation. After the end of the second week, there is no tuition or fee cancellation. Right? So please pay attention to this deadline. Right? If you want to drop, please drop in the first two weeks. But in addition, please uh, note that no withdrawals can be initiated after the end of the 10th week. And more information uh, can be found uh, at this link. Make up exam and uh, make up assignment policy. Right? No late assignments will be accepted and uh, no make up quiz. Right? So please pay attention to, uh, to this. Religious holidays. Right. Uh, students with the classes or examinations or quizzes that conflict with uh, the religious observances are uh, expected to notify the instructors well in advance so that mutually agreeable alternatives may be worked out. Uh, student stability service. Uh, if you have a uh, documented disability that requires accommodations, uh, please uh, register with the uh, SDS, right, Student Disability Service. Right, then I can give you some uh, special academic accommodations. And the, the last, probably also the, the most important item, academic dishonesty. Right, you should know this very well. Uh, my policy is right, uh, very simple. Right? Students who commit or assist in committing dishonest acts will receive F and the additional sanctions as described in the student code of conduct. 
Right? So please uh, do not cheat. Right? It is uh, not worth it. Right? If you need uh, any help, please ask me. Right? I'm very happy to help. Right? Uh, uh, please do not cheat. If you cheat, then I cannot help you. Any question about the syllabus? Okay, if there is a no question about the syllabus, uh, then we can start with uh, chapter one. So we will start with uh, chapter one, introduction. The first question, what are sensors? A sensor or a detector is a device that measures a physical quantity and converts it into a readable signal by an observer or by an instrument. The readable signal can be color change. Right? For example, pH paper, right, which you, you have used in your uh, chemistry class. Or volume change or displacement. Right? The example is a uh, mercury or alcohol temperature uh, sensor or temperature, uh, we call it thermometer, right? mercury or alcohol in glass thermometer. However, for most sensors, right, the eventual readable signal is uh, an electronic signal, right? for example, voltage. In this sense, a sensor is a device that converts a physical quantity into electronic signal or electronic domain. Right? This is a definition of sensor. Right? It's a device that converts a physical quantity into electronic domain. Note that sensors can also be called as transducers typically a transducer is a device, right, by definition, it's a device that converts one type of energy from one domain to another. Right, so strictly speaking, transducers include both sensors and actuators. So it's a, a, a broader concept. But in practice, by uh, these two terms, by uh, sensors and the actuator, uh, actuators, are often used interchangeably. They are equivalent. Based on the energy domain of the physical quantity to be measured, a uh, sensor can be uh, categorized into uh, mechanical sensors, magnetic sensors chemical sensors, optical or radiation sensors, and uh, thermal sensors. However, by this categorization is uh, not strict and there could be many overlaps. A physical quantity can be first converted into an intermediate energy domain before it is eventually converted to electronic signal. Uh, for example, right, a chemical sensor or chemical um, quantity can first uh, be converted to thermal signal, right, thermal domain, then be converted to electronic signal. Or this chemical 
um, signal can be converted to optical signal first, right? then to electrical signal. Right? So there could be many overlaps. Examples of sensors. Uh, the first example is a, a pressure sensor, right, which measures pressure. As shown in this figure, right, a pressure sensor is simply a diaphragm that is uh, supported by some type of constraint. Uh, when an external pressure is applied, here we assume the pressure is applied from the top surface, the diaphragm right, deflects. Right, so the external pressure can be detected by measuring the deflection of the diaphragm, right, which can be done using uh, piezo resistive, piezoelectric, capacitive, optical, or other sensing mechanisms. So the measurement of the pressure is converted to the measurement of the diaphragm deflection or displacement. Depending on how the pressure is measured, right, the pressure sensor can be categorized into uh, by four types. The first type is an absolute type pressure sensor. As we can see from this, uh, this figure, right, which is a cross section of you, the bottom of the diaphragm is a vacuum chamber. It's a vacuum. And we know that the pressure of vacuum is a zero. Right, so this sensor measures the absolute pressure. Right? We call this a absolute pressure sensor. And then the second type is a gauge type pressure sensor. We can see that now the bottom surface of the diaphragm is exposed to ambient. Right, so this type of sensor measures the difference between the input pressure or P input and the ambient pressure. So the measures P input minus P ambient. This is a gauge type uh, pressure sensor. Uh, the third type is called sealed gauge. And compared to the absolute type, right, right, these two types are very similar. But the only difference is that the sealed chamber is not vacuum. It has a, a reference pressure. So this type of pressure sensor measures the difference between P input and the P reference. Minus P reference, IEF, right? And then the last type is a differential type pressure sensor. Right, that there are two pressures applied, right? P input one and the P input two. Right? P input one is applied to the top side, from the top side of the diaphragm. P input two is applied from the bottom side of the diaphragm. Right, so this sensor, this pressure sensor measures the difference between P input one and the P input two. minus P input two. So 
we call this type of, type of presenter differential. Differential type presentation. Applications of pressure sensors. Pressure sensors have many applications. Here, I like to uh, introduce two examples. The first example is a tire pressure monitoring. Please know that maintaining a proper tire pressure is not only a performance issue, but also a safety issue. And now it is uh, mandatory that every tire needs to be equipped with a pressure sensor. I just, uh, I just happened after uh, the fatal rollover accident caused by underinflated five stone tires about 20 years ago. So it happened 20 years ago. It happened to a Ford Explorer. So now it's uh, it's uh, uh, mandatory that you know, every tire needs to be installed with a, a pressure sensor to monitor the tire pressure in real time. We can also find pressure sensors uh, in some smartphones. Right, the pressure sensor in smartphones is uh, mainly used to measure altitude. Right, because uh, um, atmosphere pressure is a, a function of altitude. Right? The, the, when altitude increases, the atmosphere pressure decreases. So this atmosphere pressure is a function of altitude. Right, so the smartphone can tell right, if you are on first floor, second floor, or and the other floors inside um, a building. Right, this picture shows uh, Omron's new man's absolute uh, pressure sensor. Right? It's an absolute type pressure sensor in comparison with uh, the tip of, uh, of a pencil. So you can see this, uh, this sensor is very small. Right? It's a fabricate using MAMS technology. I, I see that many of you have already taken my MEMS class, right? you, so you should know this very well. And this, uh, this figure plots uh, the center response when the altitude changes by one centimeter and the uh, not one centimeter, one meter, okay, 100 centimeter, okay, one meter or and a half meter, respectively. And we can see that accurate detection of altitudinal variations as small as a 50 centimeter is possible. So this sensor is uh, very sensitive. The second example is a microphone. A microphone converts acoustic or sound waves or pressure waves into electrical signal. So simply speaking, a microphone is used to detect sound. The microphone is very similar to the pressure sensor, right? their structures are very similar. The sensing element is uh, also a flexible diaphragm, uh, which converts the impinging or the coming acoustic wave, a sound wave into uh, the mechanical displacement or vibration of the diaphragm. So the sound is uh, detected by measuring the deflection or vibration of the diaphragm. Please note that 
A microphone also consists of a, a back plate, acoustic holes, and a back chamber, uh, which are used to tune the frequency response. And this is a pressure equalization port. It's a, simply a leaking hole, uh, which prevents the DC drift due to uh, the variation of ambient pressure. Okay, you can imagine that if without, if we don't have this uh, leaking hole, right, if uh, this back chamber is uh, sealed, then the variation of ambient pressure will change the deflection of the diaphragm. Right, so we, we do need this uh, uh, leaking hole okay, to prevent the drift of the diaphragm. So essentially speaking, microphones are simply leaky pressure sensors. The desirable frequency range for microphones is from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. And that's uh, because the frequency range of audible sound is from 20 to 20 kilohertz. If the frequency of sound is uh, below 20 hertz, we call it infrasound, right? Infrasound has a frequency less than 20 hertz. And then the sound whose frequency is uh, above or greater than 20 kilohertz is a uh, ultrasound. Okay, so we human being typically cannot hear by right, infrasound and the uh, ultrasound. Another example, a cantilever sensor. A cantilever is a beam with a free end, right, this end is free, and uh, an anchored or fixed end. Right, this end is a uh, fixed. So it's like a diving board, right? The cantilever is simply uh, look like a diving board above the no, swimming pool. And we can see it's a, it's a very simple mechanical structure. But even though it is a, a very simple structure, a cantilever can have many applications. Right? For example, a cantilever can function as a, a force sensor, a displacement sensor, surface jet sensor, temperature sensor, and so on. And the quantity to be measured, right, for example, force causes the cantilever to deflect. But then the cantilever deflection can be detected using using optical, piezoresistive, piezoelectric, or capacitive methods. Um, many different sensing methods. One specific example of cantilever sensor is a atomic force microscope, AFM. AFM is a able to detect the surface profile with a sub-nanometer resolution or atomic resolution. Right, that's the reason we call this atomic force microscope. And it is a very important tool for nanotechnology. Uh, the operating principle is uh, illustrated in this figure. A laser light, right, this is a laser light, is a pointing of the back 
of a cantilever where a very sharp tip is located. Right? We can say it's a very sharp tip, which is used to scan the sample on the news. And then the reflected laser is detected by a position sensitive device. This is a kind of uh, optical sensor, which is able to detect the position of the reflected laser light. When the sharp tip right, scans across the surface, the small deflection, right, if, if there's a you know, height variation, right, this cantilever will deflect. The small deflection of the cantilever can be amplified by this uh, optical level setup and easily detected. Right, so we, this is the optical lever setup. Let's assume this can deliver deflect by, okay, deflect downward by an angle of, uh, this angle is the theta. Okay. Then the reflected, the reflected laser light will have an angle change of two theta. Right? This angle will be two theta. Then the displacement of the of the laser beam on the position sensitive device is equal to this displacement is equal to okay, let's assume this distance is L is equal to L times two theta. Right. Since this uh, L, right, this distance right, can be very large. So a small deflection, a very small deflection can lead to a large displacement on the position sensitive device. Right. So this is a very sensitive method. Right. That's why sub nanometer or atomic resolution can be achieved. One more example, accelerometer. Well, we know that accelerometer is used to measure acceleration. An accelerometer can be modeled as a spring mass system. This is a mechanical spring, whose spring constant is the K, and this is a pull mass, which is attached to the uh, spring. When there is an acceleration A, right, the pull mass experiences a force MA. Right, this is based on Newton's second law. Then this inertia force will cause a displacement X. Right, X is equal to MA over K. Right, this is based on Hooke's law. Right, so the operation of accelerometer involves right, two physics laws, Newton's second law and uh, Hooke's law. Right, so the, the measurement um, of the acceleration is converted to the measurement of the displacement of two mass or the spring. And the displacement of pull mass and the spring can be measured using optical piezoelectric, uh, piezoelectric, capacitive, and the other sensing methods. In many cases, I right, please note that in many cases, the spring, the mechanical spring, right, is simply a cantilever beam, a cantilever, and the pull mass is attached 
to the end of the cantilever. Okay, so the measurement of acceleration right, is converted to the measurement of cantilever deflection. Okay, so that's the operating principle of uh, accelerometer. Applications of accelerometers. Uh, we can find accelerometer in many places. Like for example, Nintendo Wii Game Console, uh, which uses uh, accelerometer for motion detection, uh, which is enabled, uh, which uh, are enabling the game control by motion. Okay, so Nintendo Wii Game Console is installed uh, installed with accelerometers, right, which enable the uh, uh, motion control. And uh, traditionally, uh, we use a keyboard or joystick for game control, right? But Nintendo Wii uh, use uh, motion control. So it's a very unique. We can also find accelerometers in smartphones. My smartphones are integrated with accelerometers. The accelerometer in smartphone enables applications such as a gesture of motion detection and enable the smartphone to function as a, a pedometer right, to count steps of walking or running. So there are many uh, smartphone applications enabled by accelerometers. As a matter of fact, my sensors are ubiquitous in our everyday life. For example, there are many sensors integrated in the smartphone. Uh, for example, proximity sensor. When the phone approaches the ear, the proximity sensor can detect this action and turn off the display to prevent the user from affecting the call due to misoperation. If you, uh, the, you, your chain accidentally touches the touch screen, right? it may may cause some misoperation. Okay, so the proximity sensor is used to uh, turn off the screen and to prevent such misoperation. Ambient light sensor. Okay, the light sensor senses the intensity of ambient light, which is used to adjust the brightness of the mobile screen, of the cell phone screen. And the light sensor can also be used with the other sensor to detect whether the phone is placed in the pocket to prevent misoperation. CMOS image sensors, they are used for cameras. GPS sensor is used for positioning, uh, speed measurement, distance measurement, and uh, Navigations. Accelerometers. I uh, just mentioned the no, the functions of uh, accelerometers. Humidity sensors is due to measure humidity. Microphones uh, is due to uh, uh, detect your sound, record your sound. Uh, temperature sensors measure temperature. Uh, pressure sensors measure pressure, and uh, then it's used to measure the altitude. Fingerprint sensor, magnetic uh, magnetometer, uh, which is a magnetic sensor. Magnetometer measures the uh, intensity and the direction of magnetic field, by the Earth's magnetic field, and that is used in the compass or map navigation. Gyroscope. 
measures the angular velocity. It's angular velocity, right? rotation. It is typically combined with a accelerometer to measure um, the motion in 3D space more completely. Touch sensor, right? for example, the touch screen is a touch sensor. Next, let's uh, take a look at sensor characterization. First, calibration curve. This is the curve that describes the relationship between input and uh, output. Uh, this figure plot a uh, typical calibration curve. The horizontal axis is uh, the measurement, right? namely the physical quantity to be measured, right? such as the pressure, acceleration, temperature, light intensity, and so on. The vertical axis is a sensor output. And the front of the calibration curve, the sensitivity can be defined. Right? It's defined as the ratio of the output to input. Right? Sensitivity equal to output divided by input. Namely, the slope of the calibration curve. Right? And for a linear sensor, well, we can see that the sensitivity is constant. It's constant. From this calibration curve, we can also see the definitions of measurement range and the FSO, full scale output. The measurement range is a range from the lowest measurement to the highest measurement, right? From right, this range. This is a measurement range of this sensor. Well, FSO, full scale output, is simply the output when the input is the highest. Right? So this highest input, we can find the FSO, the full scale output. Next, let's uh, take a look at a simple numerical example. Let's consider a pressure sensor. When the input is a five Pascal, we apply five Pascal to the pressure sensor. The output is 10 millivolt. Assume the sensor is linear, a linear calibration, calibration curve. How large is sensitivity? Should be very straightforward. Sensitivity is equal to output divided by input. Right? The output is a 10 millivolt, input is a 5 Pascal. The sensitivity is a 2 millivolt per Pascal. Right? So if you apply 1 Pascal, it will give you a 2 millivolt. How large is the output if the input is four Pascal? Then we can use this definition, the definition of sensitivity, right? So output will be equal to sensitivity times input, right? So V out, right? V O should be equal to the sensitivity, two millivolt per Pascal times input, right? Now the input is a four Pascal, okay? Pascal, Pascal cancel with each other, right? So it's eight millivolt. Right? So it's better to you know, carry the units during calculation. If the FSO is a one volt, right? So this, uh, this uh, four scale output is one volt. How large is the maximum input 
pressure. Right. And now we know that the FSO, FSO should be equal to sensitivity times what? P max, right? But when the input is the highest or maximum, the output is the FSO. So P max be equal to FSO divided by S, which is a one volt divided by two millivolt per Pascal, right? So it's a 500 Pascal. That is the maximum input, the full scale input. Trade off between sensitivity and uh, measurement range. Let's take a look at this figure. Right, this figure plots three calibration curves. It can be observed that when the measurement range increases, okay, there are three different measurement ranges. Right, when the measurement range increases, the sensitivity decreases. And we can see the slope of the cal calibration curve decreases. So there is a trade-off between the sensitivity and the measurement range. Right? If we increase the measurement range, the sensitivity must decrease. Or vice versa, right? if we increase the sensitivity, the measurement range will decrease. Now here we assume FSO is constant. Okay, so this is a very important assumption. The, this conclusion is uh, based on the assumption that uh, FSO is constant. It remains unchanged. Because uh, now we know FSO is uh, equal to Sensitivity times uh, as a highest input, right? right. So if we increase the uh, sensitivity, right, the other, uh, the, the input must decrease or vice versa. And a related parameter is a, is a dynamic range. Dynamic range is a ratio between the highest and the smallest measurements. Right? For example, uh, a pressure sensor with a measurement range from one Pascal to 1,000 Pascal has a dynamic range of 1,000 to 1, right? simply uh, 1,000 over 1, right? or 60 dB. Right? We can convert this ratio to dB. Right? dB is a 20 log base 10, right? 1,000, right? which is 60 dB. Noise and the resolution. Oh, right, these are two very important parameters of uh, sensors. So, Professor, uh, yes, what is the dB actually? Is it decibel or uh, that's for sound, right? But what is the dB stands for? Well, the dB stands for the dynamic range decibel. Decibel, uh, 
It's, so, it's not okay. I know it's okay. We can use a DB to describe the sound. No, this DB is not to describe the sound. I just uh, in this case, it's described using the dynamic range, one sound over one. Okay. 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 That's a good question. Okay, noise and the resolution. Let's consider this uh, figure. If the measurement is constant, we make the input constant. Then ideally, the output should be a very clean, smooth line as shown in this figure. Right. Please know that now the horizontal axis is time. Okay, so the output as a function of time will be a clean, smooth line, ideally, right? if the input is constant. However, the real output, or this uh, red line, the real output always displays by this kind of fluctuation, namely noise. So noise refers to unwanted random addition to a signal. This uh, street line represents the, the signal. Right? And this fluctuation represents noise. And the resolution is the minimum detectable measurement that can be resolved. And we have the following equation to relate minimum detectable measurement to noise. Namely, minimum detectable measurement times the sensitivity, the sensitivity of sensor should be equal to the noise. Namely, when the input, for example, let's consider pressure sensor, when the input pressure is a minimum, the output should be just equal to the noise. Right? Otherwise, uh, the signal generated will be masked by the noise. Right? It will be embedded in the noise and cannot be detected. Right, so the, the input signal must be greater than the uh, minimum detectable measurement. And we know that in some cases, right, to have enough margin, we can require that the minimum uh, detectable measurement generates a signal which is a uh, two or three times the noise. Okay, so we can multiply a factor two or three to the noise. Now let's take a look at example. A pressure sensor has a sensitivity of two millivolt per Pascal. The noise is a 0.2 millivolt. By the, on the output, we will we'll observe a noise of 0.2 millivolt. How large is a minimum detectable pressure? Then, based on this uh, equation, P minimum, the minimum detectable pressure should be equal to what? Noise divided by sensitivity, right? S. So it should be equal to noise is a 0.2 millivolt. The sensitivity is a 0.2 millivolt per Pascal, right? Sorry, it's not 0.2, it's a two. Okay, my mistake. Let's type over here. It's 2 millivolt per Pascal, the sensitivity. So the 
minimum detectable pressure is equal to 0 0.1 Pascal. Right? Millivolt, millivolt cancel with, your, with each other. So we only have Pascal left. And this is a, what we expected. Right? So the pressure has, should have a unit of Pascal. So the minimum detectable pressure is a 0 0.1 Pascal. This means that when you when we have a 0 0.1 Pascal, the signal generated by the pressure sensor is uh, equal to 0 0.2 millivolt. It's just equal to the noise, right? So it's merely detectable in this case. So this, uh, this is a very important equation which relates by right, three important sensor parameters together, right? Minimum detectable measurement, namely the resolution sensitivity and the noise. Excuse me. Yes. Is noise also measured in volts? Um, typically in most cases. And then in chapter three, we will have more detailed discussion of noise. Okay. So thank then you. your answer will be, your question will be answered in a no, more comprehensive way. So here, I want to tell you that yeah, in many cases we use a millivolt, but we have other units to describe noise. Okay, thank you. Okay. Nonlinearity. Nonlinearity is a uh, defined as a maximum difference between the real calibration curve and uh, the ideal linear curve, right? As, uh, as shown in this figure, right? This is a solid line represent the real calibration curve. And this is dashed line represents the ideal linear calibration curve, right? This is a maximum difference. This difference is defined as uh, the non-linearity. And uh, this non-linearity can be expressed as a percentage of FSO, right? percentage of uh, full-scale output. Right? For example, the non-linearity is 2% uh, of FSO. Right? Please also know that in this figure, the non-linearity is a called terminal non-linearity. Namely, the non-linearity is compared with the theoretical straight line that passes the two terminal points, right? 0% input and 100% input, right? So we call this a terminal non-linearity. And we can also define uh, non-linearity by comparing the, you know, the real cal calibration curve with uh, a best fit linear curve. Right? So there are actually uh, a few different definitions of non-linearity. Hysteresis. Hysteresis is uh, defined as a maximum difference of output when the input is approached first with increasing and then with decreasing measurement. So as shown in this uh, figure, we have two calibration curves. And one is measured by increasing the measurement right, from zero to 100%, this bottom one. Another one is measured by decreasing the measurement right, from 100% to 0%. Ideally, right, these two calibration curves should be identical. Right, however, practically, these two curves do not overlap with each other. And the maximum difference is defined as a hysteresis. It can be expressed as a percentage of SSO, right? for example, 2%, 3%, no, 5% of 
FSO. And uh, ideally, we want this hysteresis to be as small as possible. Right? Similarly, we want the non-linearity non to be as small as possible. Zero input offset and uh, drift. As shown in this uh, figure, right, we have an ideal calibering curve and a real calibering curve. For this uh, ideal calibration curve, when the measurement is uh, zero, the output should be zero as well. That's the ideal case. But for real sensors, it is very common that when the input is zero, the output is not zero. You can see now the sensor has a non-zero output when the measurement is zero. This output voltage is typically called offset or more accurately, zero input offset right, when the input is zero. Right, this uh, parameter can be specified in voltage or percentage of FSO. Right, for example, uh, three millivolt or 5% of FSO. And this offset may also change slowly and this slow change over time is defined as a drift, it's offset drift. And we want, uh, typically we want the offset and the drift of sensor to be as small as uh, possible. Excuse me? Yes? Can you consider offset as a noise? No, offset is not noise, but the drift, very good question, okay? Because uh, if offset is constant, then we can always subtract that from the signal, right? Then it's not noise. But this uh, slow change over time is a noise because it's random. That's a kind of low frequency noise. Okay, so that's you. a very good question, yes. This drift can be considered as a noise uh, for long-term measurement. Right? For short-term measurement, the drift is very small, so it won't impact the performance. But if you are doing long-term measurement, then you have to consider the drift of the offset. And that will be a noise. Very good question. Frequent response and uh, bandwidth. Please note that the response of sensitivity of sensor is a typically a function of the frequency of the measurement, right? the frequency of the input physical quantity. This figure shows a typical frequency response of a sensor, like for example, a microphone. The horizontal axis is uh, the frequency of the measurement. I pre know that it's not the amplitude of measurement, it's frequency. The vertical axis is a sensor output or the sensitivity. The bandwidth of the sensor is uh, from this lower cutoff frequency to this uh, upper cutoff frequency. And we can see that the response or sensitivity of the sensor is flat or constant within the bandwidth. Outside the bandwidth, the sensor response or sensitivity attenuates significantly. Right, so the sensor won't be able to detect the measurement uh, or the physical quantity of interest effectively outside its bandwidth. 
Like for example, uh, for a, a good microphone, right, it's a bandwidth should be uh, from 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz. Right? That's uh, the no, bandwidth of a microphone. 